For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. According to God's standard, sin should not be permitted. It ought not be the case that one should sin, right? Right. Okay. So that means that if God is choosing, right, since he's the one that ultimately decides which world comes into fruition right since he's sovereign right he can he has to choose between a world in which there's sin and a world in which there's not sin now you've agreed you've agreed that it's possible or that both right it's it, in both. your because he's look, doing both he's doing both right is that right you, according can to you, the bible can you repeat just just yeah. elaborate on what you're saying or both. You said he can, he can create this world or that world. I said, well, perhaps both. No, no. Um, I'm it's using not possible. either or. Right? No, it it's is not either, either or. or. Like he's, 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 he's created one world here and he's created another world there. And that's where we There's only land. one actual world. And well, that's they, where I, we I could ask a question to Danny on that topic. Yeah. In this world, why do we sin? What explains? Are uh, why why is it, why are there things that go against God's commands? No, my quite well. Um, I'll rephrase it like this: What part of us is capable of sin? What part? I don't think uh, I made. A, I don't think we made good, up a part. <clears throat> so, so the answer according to Scripture is: Am I getting? Am I the only one getting feedback? Or maybe it's is just it, is it me? Because someone said told me it was. Let me let me check my you. Yeah, I, is it me, guys? Is that? I'm not sure. I can I can hear myself like an echo, but I mean that's fine. That's fine. I'll mute myself. I'll mute myself and then let me know. Yeah, it's, okay, it's, it's you. Yeah. Okay, I'll, well, I'll, I'll do I'll You're do a kind of Danny. I'll do a kind of push to talk. That way we 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 go get over. I'll do the same too, just in case. Oh yeah, it's definitely coming from you because even the static, kind of like a constant buzz that I've been hearing. It looks like it goes away when uh, um, when you mute. And according to evolution, things get better on their own. So maybe it'll yeah. it'll improve on time. its own growth it stream. Um, so scripturally, and really good conversation, gentlemen. And uh, I don't want to derail it. So according to the scripture, the part of us that sins is the part that is born of the flesh, the old man. Right? When we walk in the old man, we sin. Like um, Brother Sam was talking about earlier, sometimes we choose, unfortunately, to walk in the flesh, and that's when we sin. <clears throat> but the Bible makes it clear that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So that would be the spirit. So my question to you then, Danny, is who goes to heaven? Who inherits the kingdom of God? Based on what I just um, expounded upon, Danny. Uh under Christianity, I thought it was one that repented and turned away from their their fleshly desires and sought. You know, I I, I don't I may not have an eloquent response, but presumably well, that's fine. Done. okay. Um, so the part of us that goes to heaven, according to scriptures, is the new man, the spirit. You know, he that is born of God cannot sin. That's why the Bible over and over again says, "No sin." 
shall inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So the reason why we can't sin and yet still have free will in heaven is because it's not the old man, it's not the flesh that goes to heaven and inherits the kingdom of God. It's the new man, it's the spirit. He is who inherits the kingdom of God and he cannot sin. That's why the Bible over and over again tells us that if we walk in the spirit or if we put on the new man, we will not sin because he has no sin. So it's, it's, it's really that simple. You know, okay, it's only so, going to be the new man. Yeah, go ahead, Danny. So it's not free will that explains sin. Well, we have the free will, okay? So, for example, when we're born again, we're given the new man, but we still have the flesh. That's why Paul tells us to die daily, die to self, right? Now, for the unsaved, okay, so if you're not saved today, Danny, you don't have the new man. You just have the unregenerate old man. You just have the flesh. So you don't really have that choice to walk in the new man with the new man who has no sin. So in our free will, okay, every single day, every single minute, it's by our free will that we choose to either walk in the flesh or in the spirit, as uh, Sam was explaining earlier. But when we get to heaven, there's no flesh. So Can all I we have. My, is my let me explain my confusion. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So it seems. Let me make sure I understand you first, because it may, my criticism won't even won't even mean anything if I don't understand you. So it seems like you're saying something like this, right? That ultimately what accounts for sin in the world is going to be that kind of fleshly faculty of the, of, the, of man, right? And so now it would also you're saying is that whether you have fleshly, that fleshly faculty, right? Or whether you don't have it, you will still have free will, which means that Free will will not ultimately be ex explained, right? Why there's sin in the world? Rather, it's our fleshly faculty, our fleshly um, set of uh, fleshly part. I guess that's what you're saying, right? Uh, that that explains why we go against God. Is that do I understand you correctly? Well, the reason why we go against God is because of our flesh. That's why Jesus Christ says you have to be born again of the water. Right. That's born into this world in the physical sense, but also born of the spirit. So those that are not saved, they're not born again in the spiritual sense. So all they have is the old man, the unregenerate flesh. So when the unbeliever dies, they don't have the new man to go to heaven to so, inherit the kingdom of God. So it seems like that fleshly faculty, for lack of a better word, part, part, I think you want to use the word part, that fleshy part explains why there's sin in the world, not free will. No, we, so um, to make one thing clear, I like what you guys were talking about earlier on free will. So God could do whatever he wants. He could have, um, he, he could have done as, as ever he, he pleases, but here's the thing. Free will makes the most sense because as Sam was saying, God did not intend us to love him as robots. Just like my wife. I mean, my I weigh roughly 200 pounds. My wife is a lot lighter than that. If I wanted to, I could forcefully, you know, tell her, hey, you're going to love me today. But that's not true love in the sense that the free will gives us. And God has given us that choice to love him or reject him. And when Adam and Eve fell and sin was brought into the world, Right. When we're born into this world, when you were born, when I was born, we were born of the water with the unregenerate flesh. Now, we've inherited that sin nature from Adam. OK, so at some point we are always going to sin because we have the flesh. That's why you need the new man to inherit the kingdom of God where there will essentially be no sin. But uh, your question, I mean, yeah, there's free will to choose to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, there's going to be no sin. If you walk in the flesh, there's going to be sin. Here in this world, we sin because, because we have the choice to walk in the flesh. In the next world to come, there will be no flesh to choose to walk in. Therefore, it's only going to be the spirit, the new man. So we don't really know how that is because we have the flesh. And like Sam was saying, we don't want to put God into a box. But this is what the scriptures teach us. And I always point out if... If I could fit the infinite God in my, you know, three pound brain, he wouldn't be a, a God worth worshiping. But that's what the, that's what the scriptures teach. It's going to be the new man who inherits the kingdom of God. He's got no sin. Therefore, even with free will, 
in a in, in the spirit in the new man. We don't have a flesh to to walk in, and therefore no sin. I hope that helped. Uh, Shut up, boy. Yeah. So there. Okay. There. So it seems like what you're suggesting is that you can have a um a world or a situation in which someone has free will, right? But cannot sin. Repeat that. In, in this world, someone who cannot sin. You can. God could actualize a situation in which someone has free will but cannot sin, because. From what I understand of what you just said, that it's our fleshly faculty or fleshly part of the of man that ultimately explains sin, and so once that is removed in some you know by penal substitution or whatever kind of mechanism that God's laid out, right? Um, that there's just the spirit of man kind of regenerated, or, or I'm sorry if I'm not using the terms correctly. No, that's and, good. That's good. Yeah, um, that there's uh, so there there once that. Uh, part that fleshly part is removed one still has free will but well, cannot, cannot sin. Right. essentially i mean like i said we can't put god in a box but first john so if you go to first john here i'm screen sharing it explains it uh, beautifully for us so it, it it talks about the flesh talks about the spirit talks about the old man the new man right that's why jesus points out that it is necessary to be born again, to be born of the spirit. And when we're born of the spirit, as the scriptures say, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Okay. Because what this is talking about is going back and forth. It's, it's very black and white. It's going back and forth between the old man, and the new man. So he that committeth sin is of the devil. That's the flesh because the devil sinneth from the beginning. Right? So he was the, he was the first to sin essentially. But here, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The Bible speaks of the new creature that we are given, which is the new man. And thank God, only the new man is who inherits the kingdom of God. So how that works out in our free will, we don't have a flesh to walk in. The flesh is what sins. Okay. And when we walk in the flesh, it speaks over and over again as how, because sin is of the flesh. And sin is of the devil, so we're not going to have the flesh to actually. But you will still have free God's will. Plan. This was God's plan all along, right? But, a world but, without the flesh, a world. Now we will get glorified bodies that are also regenerated, and therefore at the resurrection, but we have a regenerated body, a regenerated spirit. Therefore, there is no sin, even with uh, free will. Go ahead, Danny. Go ahead. Yeah. So if you look at the private chat. I wrote, God can actualize a world in which all agents have free will and cannot sin. Seems like you said yes, right? And if that's yes, right, that means that sin, or really another way of saying it is that free will is not something that uh, kind of uh, makes it impossible that God can control the amount of sin in a world, right? It's not the bottleneck, so to speak, right? It, and so it, it's instead this fleshly desire in the devil, right? Now, the thing is, is that I don't see why, right, if we define sin as that which should uh, God hates, God does not desire to happen, right? That means that if God um, was able to actualize a world in which there is no sin, right, he would do that because sin is defined as um, a kind of thing that God would not want actualized, right? So that's to say that if there is sin in a world, right, that there there is some kind of – that doesn't match with a person or a, a deity that um, would, in, in all opportunities, would prevent it, right? Yeah, so good thoughts, good points. So – the Bible always defines things for us. So right here in the passage, sin is defined. Whosoever committeth sin transgress, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And that's why in our flesh we are capable of transgression of the law and, and sinning th through the flesh. But, yeah, you, to answer your question, you know, that is how it's possible to go to heaven and yet still have no sin. Now we've been given we've been given a free will here on this earth, and through Adam's and Eve's disobedience, okay, sin was then brought into the world. But at the same time, a lot of these things, because Jesus um, talks about how 
you know, there's things on this earth that we can't even understand. Therefore, how can we understand heavenly things? I mean, this is eternity that we're speaking of. This is an infinite God. This is just what the scriptures tells us. And what's nice, um, what Sam was talking about earlier, is that with all of your, your so-called holy books, it's only the Bible that is so perfectly consistent with the empirical scientific data. I am definitely in the uh, camp of evidentialism. So I always point out like Sam did and Sam, you can, you can kind of take over from here if you want. Um, the Bible makes some very specific claims that we can actually test with the evidence, with the empirical data. And it's only the Bible that's so consistent in everything when it comes to human origins, when it comes to the fall, we literally have evidence for the fall that we're talking about that all comes back to the starting point of free will where Adam and Eve weren't created as robots. They were given that choice, but God is always through his foreknowledge. He has had this plan where we must be born again, regenerated, where we will eventually be glorified, right? Because we are predestined to glorification, to be like him, where there will be no sin. I, it's an amazing thought to think about, wow, we're going to have a glorified, regenerated body. We already have, if you've been born again, we've got the uh, regenerated spirit that has no sin. So in, in the new heaven and new earth with a free will, but with a body and a spirit that has no sin, it's regenerated. You know, how is that going to be? I don't necessarily know. We haven't experienced that yet, yet but go ahead. I know I went on a, a diatribe. I mean, there. It seems like you're more interested in like the, uh, like since your background seems to be in genetics and such, right? Um, do you think, so I want to ask you a question. Do you think God is falsifiable? Do I think God is falsifiable? Yeah. I would say aspects of the creation model, like if we were to make predictions and, and retrodictions based on the account in say Genesis of, of human origin, like the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe, but we can test those claims, make predictions. Those predictions can be verified or falsified, but God himself, the ultimate creator, I don't, no, I don't think he could be falsified. I mean, Sam, what do you think? You think God himself can be falsified? No. No, I don't, I don't think so either. Well, if it's no. unfalsifiable, how can there be evidence against it? Well, that's where it goes back to the model. Like, let's, let's test the claims made in Genesis. Not that God needs to be tested, but we can. You know, for example, the Bible tells us that God created two human beings, Adam and Eve, just roughly six to 6,500 years ago. Therefore, we can make some predictions and we can see if those predictions are shown to be true. We can also make some retrodiction. And if those predictions are verified, that gives validity to the account in the Bible. But I don't see how you can ultimately falsify God himself, but we can verify the account that God has given us in scriptures. For example, the scriptures say, holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So if that's true and the Bible is inspired by God, everything that the Bible gives us about human origins should be true, right? Is there, do you think there's empirical equivalence between the case in which God, uh, let's say, created the first man and then some other um, naturalistic explanation for, for the same kind of thing in a different world? With respect to that man. What evidence do you have of different worlds? In, in, in philosophy, I'm using possible world semantics. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Well, see, that's, that. and that's where we talked about earlier is where you don't have an ultimate standard even for your knowledge of absolute truth. I don't know. Because wait, wait, I'm just saying that mo every, almost every so evidentialist – wait, wait, I'm trying – look, like, trust me, I'm interrupting for a good reason. Every evidentialist philosopher, natural, theolo the natural theologian uses possible world semantics. Alvin Plantinga, William Lane Craig, Richard Swinburne, Peter Van Enwagen, these are all theists and Christians, right? Uh, so I'm just using the same kind of tools that they use to substantiate their claims about the existence of God, right? So it's nothing to I'm, what I'm evoking when I'm saying world, like possible world, is nothing controversial. I hope someone can attest to what I just said. That's fine, but I mean that doesn't really mean anything to me. Well, you you were contesting. Um, well, yeah, because you don't have any evidence of possible worlds. In fact, we can see pretty far. What Look, I think, this I is think not Rick and Morty. See... It's not. It's not Rick and Morty, right? It's. It's. Do you understand what possible world semantics are? Be Maybe I don't. 
Yeah, it's, it's just, just saying m- multiple some... hypoth- hypothetical situations. Right, that's it's all multi- it is. Multiverse, like oh, it could happen. No, not multiverse. Different... Multiverse is completely different, right? Because you can is have multi it... multiverse can be within one hypothetical, but you can't have a hypothetical within a hypothetical. Right? Does that make sense? Like you could, we could be in a world where there are multiple. Universes. Why can't you have a hypothetical in a hypothetical? Because then the, 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 the why not? The, the, well, but, but that's what I mean, because because when you're coming from a position that's outside of Scripture, you have no ultimate source of truth. So, right. you, have so, you, have, so you have to invoke all of these hypotheticals, and well, what if there's multiple worlds, and what if this can happen here and there and there? Look, I'm just using the that. same – look, do you know who the, 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 the Christian philosophers that I cited? They use Yeah, I know the who same... some of those guys are. Okay, not, yeah, it's whatever. nothing controversial. I hope someone that is philosophically inclined can attest to what I'm saying, right? This is not – this is nothing to be um, alarmed. I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of of his position on origins. To be honest with you, I don't know that any of those. I don't know any of their positions. But I know William Lane Craig. He doesn't even necessarily argue for the Christian God. I know he's a Christian, but he just argues for like a a, a divine being. No, he used the minimal facts argument for the existence of Jesus as being God. Well, I mean, I, I think that, no, he's, I mean, I've heard him. He's, he's, he's made it clear. I've heard him, you know, speak and people ask him and he says, I didn't say the Christian God. I said any God. It could be any God. Yeah. And guess, well, get, guess what? God might come to his rescue someday. Maybe it's one of those other gods and not the Christian God. I just don't, I'm not a fan. Some, of his. Look, no, just like intelligent ID people what might say that, look, this argument only supports the fact that there's an intelligence behind DNA. We didn't say it was God. It's the same kind of. Um, okay. rhetoric sure. that that he was using, right? Sure. Um, he does. He's he's definitely had debates. But that's about, just a start. That's just a starting point. The point but, is, is that all I mean by world is hypothetical or or a scenario or um, something like that. And the point, and I, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. Okay. So take two two scenarios, right? I'll just drop I'll drop the world possible possible worlds if that's confusing. But take two scenarios, one in which. Um, there was a, you know, uh, where a, the first human was brought into existence about 10,000 years ago, but the, via naturalistic um, naturalistic means. And then another scenario in which God instantiated that first human being around 10,000 years ago. Do you think there's going to be empirical equivalence with respect to that human remain? SF, SFT? Um... Ask that last part again. I was focusing on the chat there. I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer your question. Go, go ahead. I apologize. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. So I'm saying that take two cases. Oh, can I can hear myself now? Um, take two cases, and I'll mute right after this. Um, it, there take two cases, a case in which God instantiates a human being about 12,000, 10,000 years ago, whatever year you accept. I don't know the exact year. And then um, a case where a, a, a human being is brought about by some – unknown naturalistic means uh, 10 or 12,000 years ago as well. That's around the same time, right? Now, upon discovering a human remain, I would expect there to be empirical equivalence with respect to that human remain, right? So it doesn't I, – I just don't see if there's empirical equivalence, why we would just – why we could repeal, appeal to the remains of the human being 12,000 years ago, let's say, um, as, a, as a reason to think that it was um, inten- intelligently brought about. Well, I think when we look at the entirety of both biology and genetics and chemistry, biochemistry, the impossible problem and chicken and egg. Uh, are you muted? Okay, mom. Awesome. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. It's, it's always just funny when you just hear yourself double. Um, but all the number of unsolvable it seems problems with origin of life scenarios like abiogenesis all the number of chicken and egg problems um it seems like the most plausible conclusion then would be intelligent design so a naturalistic and i remember you saying you weren't a naturalistic atheist um but the naturalistic explanation for the origin of life at this point really seems to be unscientific so It seems to be a better alternative to start from the Bible, as Sam was saying earlier, that would be our basic presupposition. And we can start from there and we can build ourselves a model. We can see that God created two human beings, Adam and Eve, but we don't have to just stop there. 
okay? We can go into the flood account. We can use genetics and we can see if there's some genetic data that supports the flood account. The fact that we were repopulated by three reproducing couples. You got Noah, his wife, okay? Their sons and their three wives. And it just so turns out that we've got three major haplogroups of mitochondrial DNA in the world, okay? That ultimately we can be traced back to, which would be Noah's three uh, daughters-in-law as mitochondrial DNA is only inherited on the mother's side. We also have evidence now for the Tower of Babel in our genetics. You know, if we wanted to go down deep, we can talk about the evidence for that in the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, and just through uh, allele frequency patterns. But here's the thing. Here's my whole point to not get too technical, is we've got an account in Genesis where you've got the creation, the de novo creation of, of two human beings, we've got an account of the flood with the bottleneck, we've got an account with, with the Tower of Babel. Genetic data has confirmed all three events. Now, one can say that this is all a coincidence. To me, that's too big of a coincidence. And therefore that okay, would tell me that the claim in the Bible that holy men spake as they're moved by the Holy Ghost, that these words are inspired by God, the creator himself. This gives the account of Genesis and human origins, the, the origin of the universe, it um, confirms it essentially, because these did not have to be true. That's the point. These did not have to be true. And yet they turned out to be true. Uh, go ahead. I know I went on a long rant there. Um, I mean, there's a lot to talk about here, to be honest, SFT, but I think the idea, the general idea I have was something like this, that it doesn't really make sense to say that you can even falsify the God of the Bible. Because let's say if I was um, a young earth creationist, and I know uh, I know you you think that a lot of the um, claims that are made in Genesis and the, and the Old Testament account can be verified. And let's just, we, I don't, that's not, just, just operate with my thought experiment for a second. But let's say... I'm an old Earth creationist, or sorry, young Earth creationist, and I and I hold to all these, um, you know, uh, I expect all these observations to be made based on the the, the account, and none of them were met, right? In fact, um, the opposite uh, was uh, were the, was the case. Like I, there was strong disconfirmatory evidence, whatever that is for you. Let's say that that was observed, right? And I'm not saying that's the actual world, right? I'm just saying in a hypothetical in which we saw everything that disconfirmed. The, uh, some kind of interpretation of the Old Testament. I don't see why I would be uh, committed to saying that, therefore, the Christian God does not exist. I would just take a different interpretation. And Maybe, I don't... Then you put your faith in the evidence, in the, in the ever-changing evidence, right, instead of the actual text itself. And it's not unfair to say that, well, I don't think you should be able to stand on the Bible because the, because just the fact that you say that, I mean, there's, there is no neutral ground, right? You can stand uh, on a hill that you defend. Well, so that's just it. I'm You're kind of demonstrating my point, right? That there's nothing, right, in principle that could falsify the Bible. Even if you were to see the exact same, the exact opposite things of, or evidence that you that you put forward tonight, and it, it wouldn't disconfirm the Bible. Well, Danny, I think you're kind of missing the big much bigger picture of what about those things that we just talked about that confirmed the Bible. And that's a very I'm small granting amount. That. I mean, I'm there's, granting there's that. a lot of no, archaeological I'm stuff Sam, that we're finding I'm granting all that. over. Granting, but you're, I'm but granting, you're kind of igno but you're no, ignoring You're not understanding it. the point, right? The point is, is that let's say that we're in the actual world in which we can verify everything. I'm just saying that in a world in which we didn't, why why should we give up the, the Christianity on that basis? But that's so the question, Danny. Danny, like you keep you keep coming at this from you're trying to like create an argument, right? But I'm talking about you personally, like you personally. I don't understand how you personally can conclude that or just dismiss or ignore or argue away everything that we're talking about, and then bring up these hypothetical worlds that don't exist. That that's foolish. You're not. I don't think like you're understanding me. I do well, understand. Would you, you. say, um, and, and Danny, I don't want to misrepresent in, in good points there, Sam. If I said, if we were arguing, let's just say, about the flat earth versus the globe, okay, and you gave me a number of expectations, retrodictions, predictions, okay, that would flow from 
a globe Earth. Hey, if the if the globe Earth is true, okay, if this is really what the, what the science tells us, then we would expect X, Y, Z. It turns out we met those expectations. We confirmed X, Y, Z. Therefore, the best explanation should be that the Earth is a globe. Okay, so let's say that. But then, if my response was, "Well, Danny, you know, hypothetically, what if we were in a world?" where all of those expectations, all of those predictions, all of those retrodictions did not come true, then you we know should what accept I mean? flat earth. We should accept flat earth, but in the Christianity is unique because it could be that, um, if we're using the flat earth analogy, that let's say flat earth is analogous to Christianity. No, no harm. No, really. I don't, I'm not saying that in any real way, right? I'm just using it in operating your, in your hypothetical, right? right, no right that, that there are, that if we were to see anything that would disconfirm Christianity, we could still rationally hold to Christianity because nothing would – it's always going to be the case that our observations, right, are going to be flawed in some kind of way um, with respect to the, the Old Testament, right? And so I'm. this is kind of what I'm saying. There's no way to disprove even a young earth creationist, right? There even The point is, is that there's nothing – Right, that would necessarily dismantle the Old Testament, right? If it's the case that we're invoking a God, right? I will say this, and I don't want to dominate. So, Sam, if you wanted to make a point there, brother. No, I'm I'm good. I probably should go to bed here in a little bit. Sam, come on, pull an all nighter. Get a pot of coffee going. You've been doing a great job tonight. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> it's addicting. I know. The last two nights, I've been on these streams for like six plus hours. I know. I, I've got to work tomorrow, too. I should have been in bed a couple hours ago. <laughs> well, these get addicting, and all of a sudden, you're like, wow, we've been talking for two, three hours. <laughs> um, they are addicting. I would say, Danny, and good questions. You're very enjoyable to talk to. Um, and here's the thing. From a Christian perspective, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to believing the Bible, God does say without faith, it's impossible to please him. So there is obviously a level of, of faith to God, to believing in God, and to accepting the, let's say, the free gift of, that Jesus Christ has offered us. Because it all comes down to redemption and salvation. Um, so therefore, yes, if it turned out that all of these basic expectations that would flow from the Genesis account of human origins. If those turned out to not be true, then we could go back and we could develop other hypotheses like, hey, maybe God front loaded Eve with multiple diverse mitochondrial DNA lines. Well, not even. You could just say that I have, more. I don't see why it's irrational to say that I, I would, I'm going to sooner accept the words of the Bible than my observations. Right. So I would say that. Faith is important, of course. It just so turned out that your most basic expectations, right? So these aren't even far-fetched predictions. For example, God says he created two human beings, Adam and Eve. So therefore, when it comes to genetics, okay, and genetics is a relatively new field, okay, versus all the other sciences, and we've seen major advancements. So one of the basic expectations would be, okay, God created two people, Adam and Eve, according to the Bible, and according to the animals, he created fully functioning ecosystems, populations of animals. So from a genetic perspective, the most natural expectation to be made from that would be, okay, if we sequence the genetics of humans, we would expect lower levels of genetic diversity because we only started from two people, right? Versus animals, the rule should be higher levels of genetic diversity because they started as populations in fully functional ecosystems. That's what the Bible says. It just turns out that those most basic expectations turned out to be true. Humans have incredibly low genetic diversity. The evolutionary community did not predict it. They were shocked. They said, what in the world? Why uh, do humans have such low genetic diversity? If we've been evolving for millions of years, accumulating more and more genetic diversity. So they had to retrofit the data into their model by suggesting there was a massive, massive population bottleneck uh, roughly 70,000 years ago, some say maybe 200,000 years ago, uh, the numbers vary, in order to reduce those levels of genetic diversity to fit the model. But it just so turned out that it fit beautifully with the Bible. Now, let's say that didn't come true. Well, we could have then said, okay, the most natural expectation didn't come true. But hypothetically, God might have 
front loaded Adam and Eve with a multitude of diverse genetic sequences or something, multiple genomes within the same genome, essentially. Like there's always something we, we could say. I just find it fascinating that the most natural expectation is what turned out to be true. I hope that made sense. I tried to explain well, it. Well, I'm not going to dispute that it's fascinating, right? Like if, um, like if you know, the, some of the archaeological, um, obs uh, you know, um, con confirmations we made of the Old Testament is fascinating, right? Um, but I, I guess, I guess, to, to, to wrap it up, I don't I don't think we agree disagree too much right now. But th this is the point I want to sum it up with this this kind of um, analogy, right? Imagine there's a room, right? And we hypothesize or we have reason to believe that there might be a basketball in the room, right? Now that generates predictions, okay? So if I were to open the door and go into the room, I would expect something that's round, that's made of rubber, that might be orange, right? I have certain things that will confirm my hypothesis or my theory about what's in, um, in, the, uh, in the room. Now, what naturally, right, if I were to go in the room and not see any of that, in fact, if I see something like an empty room, right, I will throw out my theory. I will throw out the idea that there's a basketball in the room, right? So that's typically how evidence works for me, right? That um, it's what you would expect to see given some kind of explanation or, um, you know, postulation of some kind of thing, physical thing usually. Um, you found the basketball, and, Danny. Yeah, but the, the thing is, is that now imagine this, right? This is the unique thing about God, right? Is that if I go in, right, and imagine I see an empty room. If I still thought, right, that there was a basketball in the room, despite looking at the room, right, I'd be crazy. But God doesn't function that way, right? Suppose there are certain kinds of predictions that you make of the Christian God, right? Let's say all these genetic observations and these archaeological findings, right? When I say, well, if that God exists, then I should see um, these kinds of things in the room that say in the world, right? And But the thing about God is if you don't see that, I don't think you're committed to thinking that, therefore, God doesn't exist. Which is to say that any predictions that are made from God are not going to be uh, disconfirmatory if we don't see them. Which is what I mean by unfalsifiable. I think that's kind of the idea. So, um, I just want to say that I think it's so funny that when we typically are talking with a lot of internet atheists, not not you, Danny. Well, they're always saying, oh, you know, this and that, your sky daddy, spaghetti monster, and they make all of this fun, like farting pixies. They, But here we are giving you the evidence, and you're the one who's now invoking all of the hypothetical multi-world hypotheses with basketballs in the room. It's just a full... Uh, 180. <laughs> but let but let me let me respond to that really quick. Um, so Danny, like if if in fact there this if in fact God um wants to give us a free will to reject Him, right? You're free to reject God, right? How, can He really take away like every little last bit of argument that you have? Would that violate your free will? I have to understand your question. I mean, does so, he does he have to leave a little bit of meat on the bone for you guys to still deny him, in spite of all the evidence? What are you, What are you asking me? All of these evidences that we have that have confirmed the Bible, like archaeology. Look, if you understood what I said, genetics, I'm saying it's not an evidential thing. It's not an evidential thing if you understood what I said. I I understand what you said, but well, then but what why I, what you're not I, really replying I, to it? Well, God, in order for there to have, in order for there to be free will for people such as yourself to reject and deny God, like he, he can't make the an evidential argument so powerful that you have no choice. Although it would seem that way to me, but do, do you understand what I'm saying? No, I don't. Like he's got to give you guys enough evidence so you can still deny him too. Um, well, like I said, because that that would be actually, I would think that would be for me. There's nothing consistent. that no observation that can disconfirm or confirm God. I I, I I tend to agree. 
Okay, that's From all I'm saying. From a different place than you, probably. Right, and I I don't fault any Christian that that can't help themselves, or even myself. I was one of them that when they look at DNA or they look at nature, they're just like, I got it's got to be designed, right? But to me, that's an intuition. It's not really an argument, well, but. I yeah, well. And so I don't think it's irrational, though. I don't fault any of y'all for thinking because I look at DNA and I marvel at it, right? I look at nature and I marvel at it, right? But I don't, I don't think that if someone were to have different intuitions, that they'd be irrational because, and ultimately, there's nothing that disconfirms God, and that means that there's nothing that confirms God in terms of our observations. For me, it's a purely philosophical matter. 